Uh, we're going to have a, a panel, uh, and with a little bit of luck, I hate to say this, but with a little bit of luck, we'll have some questions and answers at the end. Uh, appreciate you getting back to lunch promptly. Uh, the panel consists of Jennifer Baker, who is with Operation Us. Uh, she's the director of the, she's an associate professor and the director of Center for Innovation and Community Health at Forest Institute in Springfield, Missouri, which is a very innovative, uh, you know, PsyD clinical psychology program uh, that has really blessed many states, and particularly Missouri. Joining her are two people from Florida, Ryan Carlson and Matthew Munyon. Uh, Ryan is at the University of Central Florida, and he's been deeply involved in family strengthening. He's a licensed health counselor and nationally certified counselor uh, with the board of certified counselors. Uh, Matthew, Matt is also at Central Florida, and he served as, before that, he served as the executive director of both the Florida Commission for Responsible Fatherhood and the Florida Commission on Marriage and Family Support. Um, and he's currently the Director of Operations for the Marriage and Family Research Institute at the University of South, or excuse me, Central Florida. Some wonderful things happen in Florida as they are in, in, in Missouri. Kenny Cox is also with us uh, from the Oklahoma Marriage Initiative. Now, Will Coffin said it up really nicely because he said they just do the absolute best work in the world, and we're just dying to hear more and more about that. Uh, but Kenny will provide us with some of that information. She also works at Public Strategies Inc. and has also worked with the U.S. Department of Health and Human Services as the Assistant Secretary of Planning and Evaluation. So, if we can have those four panelists come on up. Again, while one of you talking, the crowd gets to look at, at the rest of you sitting over here playing play, and with great interest. And I think we're going to have Jennifer uh, start off and then followed by Ryan and Matthew and then Kim. So, Jennifer. understand those population dynamics when you're thinking, well, what worked in their area might work in ours, because, you know, I've heard of some great programs in some urban areas that just, as wonderful as they are, would not work in a place like Springfield, Missouri. Now, if all is well, I'll be able to move this forward. Okay, so what is a Healthy Marriage Initiative? A Healthy Marriage Initiative is uh, a nonprofit organization, let's put ahead one, is a nonprofit organization that is dedicated to strengthening families through education and outreach. And the goal is in, to enable the community, for the people of the community, to enable each other to strengthen families by encouraging and supporting marriage friendly activities. So, how did we get started? Back in 2002 and 2003, I was talking to a couple of my colleagues at Forest Institute, and I said, you know, talking about the importance of healthy marriage, and actually one of them was a secretary and the other one was a, uh, a staff person, not another professor, but we all had this desire to do something about healthy marriage. So we decided to have focus groups. I talked to the president, and I said, I think maybe because of who we are, we could be... Uh, get some people to come to focus groups. So we had a series of seven focus groups. We had two in 2002 in November. We had two more in January 2003. And then I think we had three more after that that ended up in about the May of 2003 when we said, you know what, 
let's do it. Let's just start a community healthy marriage initiative that we call Ozark's Marriage Matters. Because we didn't have a grant, we had no money, we just had a group of people who wanted to do something about healthy marriage. So what I'm going to talk to you about today briefly, and more tomorrow, and I'm doing a couple of different workshops tomorrow, uh, is how we did that, how we made that happen, and what are some of the things that we learned as a result of doing that. Up there you see that I mentioned that we had an annual survey of churches, and so let me just tell you that in the, one of the first two focus groups, an attorney in the group said, well, why should we be interested in healthy marriage or do something about that because don't the churches do that? And it occurred to us that we thought probably they didn't do that much, but we wouldn't be able to find out unless we actually surveyed the churches. So we literally tried to figure out what the 50 largest churches in our community are, and by the way, there are between three and 400. But we went around and tried to, okay, that's a really big church, and that's a really big church. So I think we got at least, it was very scientific, you know, but I think we got at least 40 of the top 50. And we put together a list of questions, and we called them. Um, and you know, it's not always easy to get the right person on the phone, but basically we did that for six years in February. We called them to see what they were doing, and I will tell you later what happened as a result of that. At least we had an idea of what the churches were doing. Okay. So eight years ago, in 2003, when we formed Ozarks Marriage Matters, we had some dreams. One of those dreams was that we would become a 501c3 not-for-profit because we knew that we need people to give us money. And uh, in order to become a 501c3, there are some complicated legal forms that had to be filled out, and that was a process that takes a few months. We also wanted to have a website where information could be shared. We wanted to access funding that would help us reach our goals and we wanted to gain attention in the community. Now, of those four things, I will tell you how we were incredibly naive. We thought that there were all these people who were doing marriage strengthening activities out there, and we would just tell them we had this website, and they could post them all on that central website, and everybody would come and look at that website. Well, what we found out was there were very few things going on, so there was nothing to post on the website. And beyond that, what we found out that when we surveyed those churches, we found out that a lot of them had things going on, but they're really just for our people. We, well, yes, we do a retreat, but we don't, we don't publicize that outside the church. We, it's really just for our people. And that there was, it was very difficult to get people to know about the website, so people weren't really all that eager to give us information to post on the website because... Why would people know to go there anyway? And then we didn't really have the staff to call everybody all the time and say, hey, what are you doing? So, and then there was no way to determine anything about the quality or the training. One thing we did know for sure is that there was no skills-based marriage education going on. So it soon became clear that we were going to have to do a little more than we thought we were. Uh, even at that time, one of the other things that we really wanted was that we wanted to make marriage education available to every segment of our community. Uh, at that time, I was teaching classes at the Greene County Jail to the inmates three days, uh, three, I did that for three years, one day a week, um, and one afternoon I went at the invitation of the sheriff, and you know what I found from those inmates? I found that they wanted what they would call the white picket fence. You know, it didn't matter if you were in jail. They were interested at some point in having a happy marriage and family. Um, I taught classes in our community mental health center, and I supervised students for nine years. I directed the marriage and family therapy program there. And when I saw couples coming in and we said, what, what can we do or what would you like to have happen as a result of coming here, I heard people use those exact words. Well, we want the white picket fence. You know, the two kids, the minivan, the car. And even though they knew no one, who do you know who's their, whose relationship you would like yours to be like? We don't know anybody. They didn't know anybody, but they knew what they wanted. And I wanted to make sure that everybody who wanted that had access to that. And we wanted to expand that mission throughout the Ozarks region. So today, eight years later, 
We do have 501c status for Ozarks Marriage Matters. We also have the federally funded Operation Us project that I direct, which is a, a large federal grant that serves 29 counties in southwest Missouri, and you'll see the figures on that in just a minute. Uh, we have intentionally blurred the lines between the two because we kind of like the name Operation Us um, because it, it involves people who are not married but may someday want to, but maybe want to have a healthy dating relationship. It includes teenagers. Um, we also have federal funding for the Operation Us project. We have lots of recognition in the local media and as well as in the national media. And we've served more than 13,000 people in southwest Missouri, which is a lot when you consider that we're not a large metropolitan area. And when I say this, this is our area right here, the largest city in that whole area is Springfield, Missouri. The next largest city is Joplin, which is about 65 miles to the southwest of us. And you all know what has happened in Joplin in the last two weeks. So um, that's it. The largest city of any sort beyond that would be maybe near Rolla, around 15,000 maybe. Fort Leonard Wood is in that area. Uh, but none of those cities are very large. We are in 67 high schools with relationship education. And some of those high schools maybe only have 100 students. So very rural area. So we have served, um, we're actually a little bit closer to 8,000 right now. Total high school students served. Uh, 882 unmarried expectant parents. Uh, a week from Saturday, we will have our third annual hitched or not and hatching event for couples who are expecting a baby who are married or not. Last year, we had 75 couples, about 40% were not married. And then we had about 15 to 20 single parents without a partner. And all, with exception of none of the men, okay, of course, but almost all the women were pregnant. And if they were not pregnant, they had a small baby with them. So here are some of the things that we have learned in the last eight years. What to expect from the faith community. They can provide a very supportive community for couples that is marriage friendly. And we, do not, we cannot underestimate how that important that is, that web of relationships. They also have resources in terms of space and sometimes childcare space that they can loan you when you're, when you're doing workshops or at a very small fee they're willing to work with you. They don't provide much financial support. Uh, you should never expect that's going to happen unless you belong to or know a very unusual church. They do not typically advertise their marriage strengthening programs to the community. They just don't have the budget to do that. And while they may want people to come, with the exception of one very large church in our area, other churches may be doing something, an event of some sort, but they don't tend to advertise it. Uh, they are somewhat skeptical of healthy marriage, healthy relationship activities that are not faith-based. So we worked very hard to build lots of bridges there, and they're not usually uh, eager to work with others. So they, we have a number of good partners now who will, come, who will allow us to come in and use their facility, but they don't necessarily want to work real closely with other churches. They'll work with us. Now, you may know some exceptions, but we've been working at this for five years, and that's um, we've had very good relationship with ministers, but they usually want the program to be in their facility. Those people, as I mentioned, are interested in marriage. Now, government funding has been very critical to helping help us make relationship education available to every part of our community because we use the radio a lot. And in using the radio, we are able to appeal to a lot of what I would call good old boys. Um, when we first did our marketing campaign, we aimed it at our marketing company and said, well, women make the decision in terms of uh, attending a relationship education event. So we're going to make the radio spots to appeal to women between the ages of 18 and 35. No one showed up. I'm not understating it. No one showed up. So then we decided that maybe we needed, if we could get the men there, the women would come. So we changed our radio spot and we called the program. We used the prep materials, but 
we tweaked it a bit and we called it Hitched and Happy. And the radio spot goes, the first radio spot went like this. Have you ever tried to fix your marriage with duct tape? Well, if you have, you know it just doesn't work. It's like trying to use a flathead screwdriver on a Phillips screw. That's why you need hitched and happy relationship tools for good old boys. <laughs> and on from there. <laughs> now, I, that we had a male voice doing that. Uh, but I will tell you, when we did that first spot, we had to rent a larger room to put all the people in. 50% of our calls were from men, and they we knew when it aired on the radio because they pulled their pickup truck over to the side of the road and called us. So, I cannot promise you that you will have similar results, but it did work very well in our area. And now we have a very good relationship with KTTS, which is our number one country station. And the guy that I'm on the radio with every so often, he and his wife have taken the workshop. And you'd think he's an expert, so. Uh, in fact, he told me that his wife said, Andy, have you been to college to learn how to help couples? And he said, well, no. And she goes, well, then shut up and let Dr. Baker talk when she's on. <laughs> So I, I guess I'll just let you talk a little more. So it really didn't bother me. Um, okay. And finally, uh, I will say this. Uh, I would not change a moment of what we've done in the last eight years, but I will tell you, it is a long road, and there are many days when you do feel like giving up. It requires lots of perseverance, so don't just do this if you think it's a nice thing to do. It's a very worthwhile thing to do. Um, it is critical that we do it. I am so happy to be involved in doing this work, but there are many valleys as well as mountaintop experiences. You need to build bridges, just like um, he was talking to us about relationships. Oh, Governor, yes. You sound from Missouri, sorry. <laughs> uh, you need to build bridges because it's all about relationships. But the destination is definitely worth it. So thank you very much.